Good morning, Maranatha Baptist Church. It's so good to be able to speak to you again, and I hope that I'll be able to see you in the not too distant future. But until that time, we'll continue on in our series through Mark's Gospel here on Facebook Live, and later we'll um, upload it to YouTube for people to share it that way too. Um, and of course, we're continuing on in our series of Mark today uh, by finishing up chapter two and beginning part of chapter three. So I'm going to begin our time this morning with our scripture reading for today, a word of prayer, and then our meditation through uh, this wonderful gospel together. So let's read the scriptures together. Listen carefully, for this is God's word to us as his people this morning. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. And he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who have no need of a physician, uh, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting and people came and said to him, why do John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast in that day. But no one sews a piece of unshrunk cloth to an old garment. If he does, the patch tears away from it, the new from the old, and a worse tear is made. And no one puts wine into old wineskins, if he does, the wine will burst the skins, and the wine is destroyed, and so are the skins. But new wine is for fresh wineskins. One Sabbath he was going through the grain fields. As they made their way, his disciples began to pluck heads of grain. And the Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And he said to them, Have you never read what David did when he was in need and was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar the high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which is not lawful for any but priests to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Again, he entered the synagogue and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, come here. And he said to them, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out to immediately went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray before we begin our time of meditation together. Help us now, O Lord, for we ask this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, imagine with me, if you can, I imagine a lot of our imaginations have gotten really sharp staying at home as of late, but imagine with me, if you can, that you're standing on the teeming streets of 1800s London. People are bustling all around you. They're either selling their wares or they're scrambling to get to work in their factories. And you can hear the clopping of horse hooves on the cobblestone. You can hear the shouting of paper boys and you can hear the distant pealing of church bells. You can 
feel that the air is humid and the ground is wet. And then standing in front of you in the midst of all this kind of controlled chaos, you see a very uh, proper and esteemed Victorian lady with a lovely dress on. But in front of her is a chamber of horrors. It's a low class brothel and it's absolutely oozing with despair. Now the woman I'm describing is not a fictional character, but it's one from church history and her name was Josephine Butler. And just like Jesus, Josephine Butler was a friend of prostitutes and sinners. Some time back, Christianity Today wrote an article um, talking about the life and the ministry of this remarkable Christian woman. Josephine Butler was a social reformer and an advocate uh, for all women, but especially poor women who had been ensnared by the sex trade uh, in London at the time. So in a day and age, in Victorian London that is, that prized as the ultimate virtue, polite speech that didn't talk about such earthy things, Butler had no problem speaking out against things that were in society unspeakable. And at the height of Victorian legalism, even in churches, when women had little voice in their own lives, little volition, she came barreling into the professional and the political world of men demanding that something be done about the barbaric treatment of poor women and children. Again, most of those who were going into such terrible lives as being in brothels. While Butler was an educated and cultured woman, it wasn't any sort of humanitarian um, uh, training that led her to be this way. Rather, it was her fierce devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ that led her on what she called a consecrated rebellion. And it was a consecrated rebellion against the rich and the powerful who were using and abusing and exploiting the poor and the forgotten. So she was born in England in 1828 to an abolitionist named John Gray, and later she married a minister named George Butler. And Josephine Butler throughout her life was surrounded by good men. She knew firsthand what it meant like, what it meant uh, to be treated like an equal uh, by men of good standing in society, not simply as an equal um, in sociological terms, but as an equal image bearer of God. And she knew firsthand how that could revolutionize the lives of women, many of whom were, be were being treated so poorly. So she began years of intensive labor rather than resting on her laurels rather than using her wealth and her culture to just enjoy her life. But she began working hard for political reform to eliminate the plague that was child prostitution and to repeal very dehumanizing laws against prostitutes, most of which always penalized the woman and never the men that were abusing them. And finally, to provide women with ways to escape this old life and to have a new and real future where they could be treated like a human being again, since most of them had been either forced by circumstance or either kidnapped into their trade. And of course, during this day, Josephine Butler did not have many powerful allies because aristocrats, noble women, and so on and so forth, these people despised her. She was associating with the quote unquote vile and disgusting scum of London. And for every poor sex worker that she bef befriended, she isolated a dozen of England's most prim and proper citizens. And consequently, she has been all but forgotten by British history. Before having read this article, I, I had no awareness of this woman's life. And I'm sure that's the case for many of us this morning. But let me tell you something that I know is true of Josephine Butler, that although history may have forgotten her, the women and children that she helped and that she loved, they never forgot her. And even more importantly for us to remember as Christians is that she is still remembered today, not just by us, but by our Lord Jesus, who also 
is a friend of sinners. Now, this is a long story, I realize, and it's a very uncomfortable subject for most of us to be thinking about, certainly on Sunday morning when we're coming to church together. And talking about this evil trade is, is not polite dinner conversation. We don't bring it up when we're with people. But Mark's gospel should cause us to squirm a little bit because it reveals a Jesus Christ, a God in the human body and human flesh that erupted into a fallen world for the express purpose of finding and loving sinners for finding and bringing unloved prostitutes and crooked politicians, people that we don't like to talk about even, for bringing those to his kingdom and to his dinner table. So if we claim to be followers of our Lord Jesus, then we too must have this kind of love, must have this kind of concern for our fellow citizens. And our text this morning is scandalous in that sense. It's scandalous both to the religious people of the day and to the cultured people of our day, I imagine, because it reveals a Jesus who is a friend and a forgiver of sinners. And it shows us a Jesus who is so much more concerned with human restoration than he is with being a legalistic stickler. Jesus cares so much more about rest than judgment of sinners. But before we get into that, let's remember where we've come from so far in our text. Last week, our gospel lesson revealed to us the heart of Jesus and the heart of his ministry. So many people have impressions of Jesus, but this is the real one. He's the Jesus who preaches and who prays. He's the one that heals and forgives. And he's the Jesus, most importantly, that goes out into the desolate places to find sinners like us, and to send us clean and purified and forgiven back into the heart of society. And while everyone admires Jesus when he's healing lepers and paralytics, so many of us, I imagine, find it offensive that he would forgive bureaucrats and prostitutes and Sabbath violators and all manner of sinners. But we're Christians today, I'm convinced, because this is the truth of the good news that Jesus loves the vilest of the vile. In today's passage, Jesus returns to his mission of preaching and ministering the kingdom of God. Jesus is back at his old stomping grounds besides the Sea of Galilee on the coast. And as he's going, he happens to pass a tax collector. The scriptures tell us, and as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth. Now, we see that Jesus has called four other disciples so far in his book, and now he's about to call a fifth. And unlike the other four, we don't really get a lot of information about him. In fact, this is the only time he's mentioned. This is the only time we see him in Mark's gospel. And he doesn't speak. He doesn't say anything for himself. And then we never hear from Levi again. And we do know from... um, our further reading that uh, Levi also has the name Matthew, and he eventually wrote his own gospel. But from this story itself, we don't really know much about Levi. But what we do know about him, I think, is very important. So a couple things that we do know. First, we know that Levi, Alphaeus, is a tax collector, which implies how he is seen and perceived as a sinner in his day and age. So based on his location, he's collecting money from fishermen and probably exclusively working class families. In other words, here is a Jewish man, a son of Israel, that is using his career to take money from other poor Jewish people under the oppression of the Roman Empire. And so not only is he benefiting himself, but he's enriching Israel's oppressor. So to his fellow Jewish citizens, Levi would be seen as a cheat, a traitor, and an absolutely unlovable sinner. That's the kind of person Levi would be perceived as. So that's what we know about him. And secondly, we also know that when Jesus speaks to Levi, Levi follows. Verse 14 gives us this simple exchange. Jesus says, follow me, and the text reports, and he rose and followed him. It's that simple. 
And I think this shows us that when the authoritative voice of Jesus resounds throughout the air, even an, a corrupt and despised sinner like Levi cannot resist following after his maker, his defender, his redeemer and friend, as the old song goes. It turns out that the presence of Jesus is a kind of fragrance in our putrid and angry world. It's the fragrance of kindness and forgiveness. And for us, I think this means that when we have Jesus' presence in our lives, that it means that when we are around people that are despised by society, that we should, as opposed to so many people, be a radical comfort, even to the most difficult people in our lives. In other words, being a faithful Christian, I think, means that the unwanted people of our society, maybe of our families, maybe in our friend groups, should be drawn towards us in some way, not pushed away by us. But they're not simply drawn to us because we're nice people, but they should be drawn to the forgiving nature of Jesus Christ that makes itself manifest in us. Because Christianity is a, ultimately, it's a sinner-friendly religion. It's a rehumanizing faith. It actively, actively looks for broken and battered people who are unlovely and impolite to love and to make um, into friends. So my prayer for us, my prayer for me as a Christian, is that God would help me to be this way to other people, that Jesus Christ's presence would be so clear in me that it would be easy for quote unquote unlovable people to feel loved through our fellowship. Let's continue on and look at verse 15. It's really breathtaking, I think, what we see Jesus do here. He's not just simply paying lip service um, to loving sinners. It's easy to talk about doing that. Um, it's not as easy to actually do it, though. But he's putting it into action. Mark tells us that he's reclining at Levi's table, and he's reclining there with all the other openly despised sinners of the day. Isn't that stunning? Jesus not only acknowledges and talks to these people and when he encounters them, but he gladly goes into their homes. And uh, in the South, we may say that he goes and grabs a glass of sweet tea and a drumstick uh, and has, a, and has a, a big fellowship meal afterwards. And he laughs and he talks to these people and they exchange stories. And he's doing this not with, remember, the prim and proper, but with the scoundrels of society. The Apostle John tells us the reason why this happens in his first letter. We love Jesus because he first loved us. And that's what's happening here. He loves these people so much that they can't help but love him back. And I think it's the same way that when we come to church together, when we come to the Lord's Supper table to partake in the bread, to share the cup together, it's only because Jesus first loved us when we were sinners and scoundrels that we feel free to do that. And the goodness of our gospel is that our God in human flesh eats with us and he fellowships with us and he loves us. But the churchy people don't like this at all. The Pharisees immediately began questioning Jesus' motivation in disgust. And Jesus hears their pride and sanctimony from perhaps the other side of the room. In verse 17, he says to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. And I came not to call the righteous, but to call sinners. Now, I think there's a level of irony working in this part of the text. It's an irony they can't understand because it's true that Jesus came to call sinners and he came to be the great physician of uh, spiritually and physically sick people. But what the Pharisees can't seem to see in themselves is that they, for all their lack of mercy towards their neighbors that God's commanded them to love, and they, for all their disdain for their God who is in flesh before them in their very presence, they are also sick and they are also 
sinners, perhaps even worse off because they don't even realize it. So friends, this is a good reminder for us to never be the kind of Christians that mistake, mistakenly believe that we're any better off than an addict or an escort or a prisoner or a thief or a politician or a pagan or an atheist or any one of the people that we consider um, not polite in evangelical society. If you love Jesus, it's simply because he first loved you. And if you belong to a church, it's because you first belong to him. You know, as church people, I think this may be one of the more difficult things for us to take seriously when we encounter in God's word. Because look here at what other church people, when they're in the presence of Jesus, how they're responding. So there's a couple groups that are uh, juxtaposed here in the passage. We know about the Pharisees, but there's also John the Baptist disciples. Of course, John's ministry was pointed, was completely oriented towards Jesus. But here we have some of John the Baptist's disciples being around Jesus, not realizing who they're actually with. We have to be careful, I think, Christians, in our devotion and practice, because John the Baptist was a very good preacher. He proclaimed a gospel message from the scriptures, and he taught sound theology. But notice here, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, the one that he had been pointing towards, is in their midst, and yet they're fasting and mourning and lamenting. Jesus clarifies for us in verses 19 through 22, while fasting is unnecessary when he's with them. As an illustration, have you ever been invited to a wedding reception only to go and find out that there's absolutely no food or no drink there? Of course not. Why would a bride and groom have a wedding reception uh, for you to celebrate their marriage with them um, and ask you to come to reception where there's no uh, no thing to celebrate. There's um, uh, just a, a small room with empty tables. It's, it's nonsense. It's, a, it's an absurd picture. And that's the point that Jesus is trying to highlight here. Because when Jesus is in the presence of his people, when the groom is come to wed the bride, when Jesus is physically present in our world, there's only cause for celebration. It's not such a sweet aspect of Christian life, when we gather together and we believe and see that Jesus is working really in our midst, that we have all the cause in the world to celebrate, to have joy, to uh, enjoy feasting, to enjoy singing, to enjoy laughing. But Jesus knows that there's a time that's going to be coming when he, the groom, will not be present with them bodily as the bride. There will be a time when it is appropriate to fast and to mourn and to hope and to meditate on this truth that although he may not be bodily in our midst, he will be one day again. I think one of the rich traditions that we celebrate in the church and all sorts of denominations um, has been the keeping of a, a church calendar, so to speak. And it, it's a calendar that follows the life of Jesus while he was here on earth. It goes all the way from the announcement of his birth and all the way to his ascension on the throne. Now as Baptists, we tend to be very good at celebrating the two high points in the church calendar, Christmas and Easter, the birth and resurrection of our Lord. And we should be. And that's, uh, if, if you gotta pick two to celebrate, those are the two best ones I think you can. And the good news that we, we claim and the gospel that we believe are inextricably tied to these sacred moments in history when God and Jesus Christ enters into our world and when he rises from the dead in redeeming us. So that's important that we celebrate those. But I've often wondered why it is that we don't observe the more somber parts of the church calendar. Why don't we don't have a, a, a rich and a robust time to think about things like Advent, and think about Lent, which, of course, are the seasons that lead up to Christmas and Easter, respectively. There are time in which we prepare. 
when we fast and lament and mourn because of how broken and sinful our world is and how desperately we want Jesus to be bodily in our presence. Because when we look out at the world, it's not easy to see the kingdom of God. And it's not easy to see that the peace that Christ is ushering in. Instead, when we look out at the world today, especially during these days when we're, many of us are still at home, working from home, um, scared to go out for health concerns, it's easy for us to see the terror of the adversary prowling to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. Folks, even now, maybe even especially now, there are good times for us as Christians to fast and to pray and to lament and to repent at the world in which we live and look expectingly towards a filled manger and towards an empty tomb. And I think that's the distinction Jesus is drawing out for us here. But we need to understand this. We don't lament and we don't fast as those that have no hope. Jesus has begun unfurling his kingdom. It's coming whether we think we're doing anything about it or not. The gospel he preaches, the truly good news that he preaches is uh, summed up in these illustrations that he gives. Uh, these illustrations about new wine and old wineskins and new cloths on old clothes. And the message and the, the way of understanding um, God and his redemption can be found here. The truth of Emmanuel, God with us, cannot be tied simply to old religious practices. So, for instance, in Zechariah 7, Israel is seen complaining about how much they fast and how much they do to impress God. Israel complains to God, shall we also weep and fast on this extra month in addition to others? Will that make you happy, Lord? And God immediately and thunderously claps back at them, saying, you're not fasting for me. You're not hoping for my presence in your lives. You're doing it for yourselves. You're doing it for your own piety and your own praise. You see, friends, this is the old way of religious thinking, fasting in order to impress God. But God is unimpressed completely by our human effort. True fasting, true mourning, true repentance is done not with ourselves in mind, not in the religious good we're doing, but those things are done for the sake of our neighbors, mourning, sacrificing our time and energy and, and care to, to seek out justice and goodness for these people. It's, it's a, a kind of way that we can uh, show compassion and love towards others. That's what God says is the true spirit of fasting in Zechariah 8. And the pinnacle of true fasting, as he points out in Zechariah 8.23, is when the world looks at worshipers of God and says, let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. It's the kind of, it's the kind of spirit that draws sinners towards us not because we're trying to impress God, but because we are so um, loved by God and so um, mournful over the state of this world that we lament and, and, and do things in order to um, be good to our neighbors, not our, bring our own um, piety uh, into it. And the point that Jesus is making, I think here, is that these old religious ways are beginning to pass away, and a new kingdom is at hand. The dried out wineskins, the moth-eaten clothes of, of, uh, of churchy hypocrisy, those things must be cast aside because there is a new wine that the Lord is making and a new cloth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as Zachariah reminds us that God is now with us, and that's what attracts sinners to our presence, not just the religious rituals, but the fact that God is in a real way very much with us. And of course, all of this religious discussion, it all leads up to this, this important moment in Israel's own church calendar or their own religious calendar. 
it culminates in Jesus on the Sabbath day, on the day of rest, the central part of their week, revealing a new teaching about the Sabbath. God gave uh, Israel this day of rest, and it's a natural, it's a national day of rest and recuperation and of worship. And it was supposed to be the center of their week, and the penalty for violating it was so strong that it could even incur stoning, we read in the Old Testament. So God took this day very seriously, and they were to take it seriously too. But as human beings have a way uh, of twisting and abusing what God gives us as gifts, we see that that's happening here at this point in Israel's history. We take, and we, we can do this as Christians too, we take these clear and gracious commands of God and twist them into something that we can use to hurt other people. So God gives us a gift like Sabbath, a day in which we're supposed to be restored, a day in which we're supposed to have a time of, of leisure with our, our families where we can cease from our labor, and we can twist it into a way that we can use to incriminate and condemn our brothers and sisters that aren't keeping it as well as we're keeping it. How else can we explain the poisonous slander of the Pharisees when in verse 23, it tells us that on the Sabbath, when the disciples are walking through grain fields and they're going along and they're beginning to pick some grains and, and pop them into their mouth because they're hungry, how these uh, Pharisees are outraged at this. By the way, it seems that the Pharisees just don't know their um, law very well, or if they do, they're just forgetting conveniently this part of it. Because in Exodus 23, 25, we see that this is, is explicitly allowed for. If you go into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck ears with your hand, but you shall not put a sickle to your neighbor's standing grain. So this is something that's allowed under the law of God. But what's important here is the attitude behind this uh, keeping of the law. Because as Jesus points out, what is better in the eyes of the Lord? Is it a man who's fainted in the heat of the day from hunger, scared that he might violate this, this sacred day? Or is it a man who's taken from the abundance that God has given to his people through his neighbor's crop and preserve his own life? And God's mercy assures us it's definitely the latter. God wants life, not suffering and death for his people. And the Pharisees seek to make the Sabbath into just a, a series of, of cruel and unbearable laws. But Jesus defends his friends. In verse 25 and 26, we read this. And he said to them, have you never read what David did when he was hungry and he was in need? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of presence, which is not lawful for any but priests to eat. And also he gave it to those who were with him. In other words, David is eating a bread from the tabernacle that is not meant for him to take and to eat. It was, uh, it was a holy bread. It was a consecrated bread. And it was not baked to be given to fugitives um, as they're escaping. But David is God's man. And God gives to his people their daily bread. In this, in this case, quite literally, he does that. So Jesus asks, he looks and he says, you Pharisees, you legalists, do you not remember this? And I can almost hear it now. It says that, text says that the, the, they became completely silent. Perhaps they're walking through this field and all we're hearing now in this deathly quiet is the wind blowing through the grass and through that wind, through that spirit, the word of God is may, uh, making these um, issues, these fleshly issues, um, he's changing them with his new and authoritative teaching. Verses 27 and 28, we see that Jesus makes this summarizing statement. The Sabbath was not made or the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. That the laws of God were for the benefit of people, not people made for the benefit of the laws of God. So even now the man, or the son of man rather, is Lord of the Sabbath. 
So here's what I think Jesus is saying in this passage. Jesus gives the Sabbath, God gives the Sabbath as a gift to his people, Israel. And Jesus is the Lord that presides over the giving of that gift. And Jesus is coming to give a new kind of rest, a new kind of gift, because he is coming into our world, as we read in Colossians um, 2, 16 through 17, um, that therefore we shouldn't let anyone pass judgment on you in questions of food or drink or in with uh, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath, because these things are a shadow of the things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. In other words, the, the Sabbath day, the religious holidays, the festivals, the feasts, those are good things, but they're only a shadow of the greater substance that's coming when the presence of Jesus is in our lives. The old kind of Sabbath has passed away, and it's, it isn't simply just a, a day of rest anymore, but the true and better Sabbath, the real rest, the eternal everyday rest that we find is not again in one day of the week, but it's in a person that comes to us to be with us in his body. Only in him do we find ultimately all our religious strivings, all of our labors of the world. Only in him do we find that these things these strivings cease with his infinite grace. Now, this explanation does not satisfy the Pharisees, and it doesn't satisfy a lot of religious people that feel like that um, they're earning God's favor and grace, they're earning their place in his kingdom by their good work. In fact, it's infuriating to people. But in the next passage, we see uh, Jesus enter into a synagogue to proclaim the good news of his kingship to a people that need to hear the good news, no matter what the religious opinion of the day is. And we see a man with a withered hand, again on the Sabbath, uh, and it's a crippling disease for somebody, especially that's living in a society that runs on manual labor. We see that Jesus approaches him. And Mark says in, in chapter three, verse one, that they watch Jesus in order to see if he would miraculously intervene and heal a man on this day of rest in order that they might accuse him. Isn't that incredible? Jesus is here. He's making sure that people are being fed and they're not going hungry. And he's even healing people of their physical infirmities. He is God in their midst, helping them to become completely and fully human again. All they want to do is accuse him and get rid of him. And I'm hoping for us as Christians that we can, we can guard against the kind of religiosity that would tell us um, that we know better than what God knows, that we know what's right and we do what's right. And when God is doing something that's contrary to what we were expecting, that that's wrong and improper. And so we see that the Lord of the Sabbath heals this man on the Sabbath day. And rest assured people that there is no evil or sinful thing in our Lord. But his work often does make us uncomfortable. But it's never evil. It's never sinful. And he asked them about their accusative look in verse 4. He says, is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save a life or to kill? And yet again, they remain silent. Well, the fact of the matter is the word of God, that is Jesus, has spoken. And it has silenced all his adversaries, whether they're religious adversaries or whether they're spiritual, demonic adversaries, as we've seen before. And this makes Jesus desperately sad, desperately, and also makes him angry because their hearts have become so hardened. They've been so intent on keeping every jot and every tittle of the law of God, they've forgotten to love the God of that law and to love the neighbors for whom he's given that law. And Jesus commands this man to stretch out his hand, and of course, Jesus restores it. Yet they don't rejoice. Instead, we see them sneaking away and plotting with the Herodians how that they might destroy Jesus and his ministry. All of this is foreshadowing of what we'll find 
when Jesus goes to the cross. When all the powers of the world, when all the religious people have conspired to plug their ears and to not listen to the word of God, but instead to remain loyal only to not people, but their dogged legalism that they choose over the welfare of their neighbors. And they have taken um, a tradition that is meant to give life and to, meant to give joy and used it as an occasion to plot the death of their maker and their redeemer. And I suppose there's one last question for us to reckon with as Christians as we're thinking through this passage. Well, is Jesus what the Pharisees accuse him of? Is he a Sabbath breaker? Or is he what these people that have been healed? Is he what the disciples that have been fed? Do, is he a Sabbath bringer? Well, I think in some ways that he is a bit of both. It depends on how you look at the situation. On the one hand, I think he does break the terrible and false expect expectations of what the Sabbath is all about. I think he disabuses us of the cruel traditions that sometimes that we can uh, we can let calcify as churchy people. But he does this not just simply to break down traditions, but he does this in order to give a new and a better tradition a, and a, a new and a better gift. And that gift, that new rest, that new Sabbath is himself in our presence, giving us the rest that we can never find in just one day away from work. But the spiritual and physical and uh, emotional and, and social rest that we all need when we come to Jesus, to Christ. And I think that as we consider all of these things, as we consider how Jesus is a friend to sinners and how he gives rest to all manner of people, that we can spend the rest of this day and the rest of this week and the rest of our lives being truly grateful that Jesus chose to be a friend to sinners like us and that his ultimate goal and purpose for us, even in the midst of such hard times, is to give us true and abiding rest in him. Let's pray. Oh God, we pray that you help us now. We are people that often love to use our religion to, to strive in vain to gain your favor. And show each of us this morning that you give ultimate and better rest through the person and the work of Jesus Christ, who is the eternal God and your beloved son. So Lord, may we be like Levi. Since we, like him, are sinners in need of love and forgiveness, let us be people that follow after you. And let us be good celebrators of this good news that you give us. And let us be good mourners and, and fasters and lamenters when uh, the time calls for us uh, to do so. And Father, we pray that you pour out the good wine of faith and cover us with the new cloth of your grace. And above all, Lord, let us take our Sabbath rest, not simply in a day, but in a person, and you, Jesus, to Christ, whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. For it's in the name above all names that we now pray and ask. Amen. God bless you and see you soon.